Hello, tonight we're going to talk about meiosis. Meiosis is the process of producing gametes, and we're going to talk about that specifically, but we're also going to talk about different forms of sexual reproduction. Let's start with asexual reproduction, which is reproduction without um, using a partner. Okay, there's many forms of asexual reproduction. All the offspring from asexual reproduction are clones of the one parent. Okay, so let's look at some of the specifics. Bacteria go through a process of binary fission where one bacteria cell divides into two identical cells. Very simple reproduction. Sponges go through a process called of asexual reproduction. They have three of them. Um, fragmentation, the production of gemmules, and budding. Okay, fragmentation basically means if you take a sponge and during a really bad storm the sponge gets broken up into five different pieces, each of those five pieces can grow into an adult sponge. Um, budding is when an adult sponge forms a baby sponge on the side of it, and then when it's big enough it breaks off and becomes an adult sponge, just identical to the parent sponge. Now gemmules are a little bit different. Those only occur in freshwater sponges like sponges around here in Michigan. Gemmules form because they cannot survive the freezing in the winter time. So what happens in the fall is that adult sponge takes certain cells from the inside of their body called amoebocytes. And those amoebocytes cluster together into a little tiny dehydrated ball. That ball is called a gemmule. In the springtime, that gemmule rehydrates and becomes an adult sponge. So it's a form of surviving in the wintertime. Another form of asexual reproduction is regeneration. That's when a piece of the body gets broken off and the organism can regrow it. For example, a starfish can regrow an arm. A planaria can regrow a head, missing body parts. Plants can also go through asexual reproduction by vegetative propagation. What that means is that they can do all sorts of things asexually. For example, strawberries produce these things called runners, which is a little tiny tissue like a tube that grows from the parent plant over, oh, about a foot or so. And when it hits the soil, then it grows roots and becomes another adult strawberry plant. That's a vegetative propagation. You can also take a plant, a part of a plant, stick it in a glass of water, and it'll grow roots and become an adult plant. That's another form of vegetative. Grafting is another form of vegetative propagation. So there's many of them. Okay, so let's go through some of these very quickly. Binary fission, like I said, one bacteria cell replicates its DNA, divides into two. That's binary fission. Now, some organisms can do both sexual and asexual reproduction. Well, I just mentioned a strawberry plant. They can do those runners, which is a vegetative propagation. They can also produce flowers, which is a form of sexual reproduction. Bacteria can go through binary fission, which is asexual, but they can also go through an exchange of genetic material called con conjugation, which is sex. Some frogs, fish, aphids, and lizards can do sexual reproduction, but they can also do something called parthenogenesis, which we're going to go into detail about. Parthenogenesis is the reproduction of fertile offspring from unfertilized eggs. It doesn't occur in very many organisms, but when it occurs, it's really kind of cool. Okay, um, This particular picture is of a lizard that in this particular species of lizard, there are no males. Every single lizard is a female, and yet they're able to produce fertile, fertile eggs that become adult girls. That's really weird. So, this whiptail lizard, it's very strange behavior. Somehow in this lizard, all of the males died. And so what happens is when the estrogen level is very high, I think it's estrogen. Does it take, does it tell us? Okay, when the estrogen is very low, they take the role of the female. When the estrogen levels are high, um, no, they're male when it's low, high when it's female. Okay, so here's what happens. 
When the estrogen level is low, the female takes on the role of a male. Now, there's no exchange of genetic material, but what she does is she goes through the courtship rituals and pretends to mount the female. That causes a spike in the female's, the other female's, estrogen levels, causing her to ovulate, and those eggs then will grow and become adult females. But she will not ovulate the eggs unless she is mounted by another female. Very strange. Very, very strange. Okay, I'm going to give you a minute to read this, but that's basically what I told you. Okay, let's talk about sexual reproduction. Um, in plants, sexual reproduction involves the exchange of pollen between different flowers. Okay, the, fl the pollen is the male gamete, and inside the flower are female gametes, which are the ovum, which are the eggs. Um, the they exchange the genetic material and you grow some type of a fruit with seeds and grow a new plant. In mammals, it's the exchange of sperm or the placement of the sperm inside the female which exchanges the genetic material. Okay. Meiosis is the process of how those sex gamete cells are going to be produced. But before we get into that, let's watch this YouTube video. I think you're going to like it. I did. Have you ever wondered why we have sex? Okay, correction. Have you ever wondered why there is sex? I mean, I'm sure that your parents went over the basics with you when you were 11, or maybe you learned it from that, like, bossy girl at the public swimming pool. But no matter where you learned it, the gist is probably the same. We have sex so that we can have more people. Same goes for grasshoppers and pandas and poppies. Sexual reproduction exists to make new animals, right? But some animals totally abstain from the sex, and they still get the job done making babies all day long all by themselves. If it's possible for some animals to reproduce without having sex, why doesn't everybody just do it that way? You know that something's up when the majority of all animals reproduce sexually, at least some of the time. Some biologists have calculated that 99% of plants, animals, fungi, and protists have sexual reproduction, at least some of the time. And some animals, like starfishes and slugs and strawberries, they can do either depending on how they're feeling that day. So sexual reproduction, that just means that two organisms of the same species get together and combine their genetic material to create a new organism that's genetically a little bit different from both of them. Included in this category are you and me and all of the pandas and grasshoppers and poppies. Asexual reproduction doesn't rely on mixing anybody's genetic material. Basically, it lets you make a baby whenever you feel like it, creating a genetic clone of yourself. And this can happen in a number of different ways. Binary fission, which a bunch of bacteria and protists and unicellular fungi do. This is when an organism just splits in half and the halves go about their business until they're mature enough to split in half again. Budding, which is what hydras do. They make little buds that pop off of the mom hydra when they get big enough. Organisms can also reproduce vegetatively through bulbs or tubers or rhizomes. And now for parthenogenesis. This little girl here is a New Mexican whiptail lizard, and I know that she's a girl because they are all girls. Parthenogenesis literally means virgin birth. These whiptail lizard ladies can form embryos inside of themselves without being fertilized by a male, which is good because there are no males. It's more common in arthropods, but as larger animals go, lizards seem to have the knack of it. There's also fragmentation, where a parent can break into a bunch of different pieces, each of which can then produce its own offspring, and I could go on and on. So on the surface of things, making these quick and easy copies of yourself seems to be a pretty good way to go. I mean, sex is awesome at everything, but it isn't particularly convenient. First, you have to find a suitable mate, which, you know, we've all had our troubles with. And then you're stuck with only half of your population being able to give birth, the other half just being useless. And generally, sexual reproduction happens on a slower time scale. By the time sexual reproduction results in one round of offspring, asexual reproduction has had like three generations and they're all off in the world making friends and influencing people. And yet still, sex is a thing. 
It's a very popular thing. It turns out that combining the genes of two different members of the same species is worth all that time and effort. The key here is that gene variation makes a population of organisms less susceptible to disease and more able to survive if conditions get crappy. When times get tough, the population is genetically diverse enough that at least some members will survive. And say a population is all but wiped out, sexual reproduction allows for a genetically diverse population to be rebuilt from a relatively small number of individuals. And then there is the Red Queen's hypothesis, named after the Red Queen in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, who said, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. The idea here is that a species needs to constantly adapt in order to keep up with predators and parasites and competitors. Studies have shown that snails and worms that reproduce sexually are way better at resisting infestations than snails and worms that reproduce asexually. It's basically an arms race, and sexual reproduction and the genetic variation that it provides is the only way to keep up. And finally, possibly the best reason for sex is the same reason that we don't tend to mate with our family members. Organisms that reproduce asexually rely on genetic mutations for all of the genetic variation within their population. But most of the time, when genes mutate, the result is a bad thing for the population. So after many generations of cloned organisms, the bad genetic mutations tend to pile up and they can actually wipe out entire populations. Which is why lots of organisms that reproduce asexually when conditions are great reserve the right to sometimes reproduce sexually if conditions get worse. So there you have it. Asexual reproduction seems like a great idea, but in the end, sex rules. For more information on sexual and asexual reproduction, see our citations in the description. If you have questions or suggestions, you can ask us on Facebook or Twitter, or of course, in the YouTube comments below. Use a condom. So let's look at the parts of meiosis so we understand how it's different from mitosis. Okay? First of all, there are some major differences that you need to know. Meiosis has two parts, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. The purpose of it is to cut the chromosome number in half from 2n down to n so that if you have an n gamete and an n gamete, you put those together and it creates an organism with 2n number. So in humans, a sperm has 23, which is N. The egg has 23, which is N. Together they make 46, which is you. You have a 2N number, 2 times 23, 46. Okay? Also, during prophase 1, a tetrad forms and crossing over occurs. This provides the variation that he was talking about in the video. Also, meiosis only occurs in sex cells like sperm or eggs. So let's go through it. Okay, you start with two chromosomes. Okay, one you got from your mom, one you got from your dad. During the S phase of mitosis, oops, the chromosomes are replicated. So now you have two from dad and two from mom. When you go into meiosis one, you have you split so that you just have two from either your dad or the two either from your mom. Then you go into meiosis two and those two separate so that each of the gametes has one of them. More details than that, okay? First of all, you have prophase one. Prophase one, many of the same things that happen in mitosis happen in prophase one. Okay, so here we go. The nuclear envelope disappears, same thing. The nucleoli disappear, same thing. Chromosomes condense. However, this time, instead of having your two sister chromatids together, forming a chromosome, now you're going to have the two that were from your dad and the two from your mom forming a tetrad. Tetra means four. So your tetrad means all four of the same type of chromosomes are going to be together. They're aligned together. They're aligned at um, side by side. Then you're going to have crossing over occurring. Crossing over occurs when the two middle ones flop their arms over top of each other and they cut at a spot called the kismata and reattach so that you mix up the DNA. Let's look at a picture so you can see that. Okay, the two middle arms flop over top of each other, cut and reconnect, so that this one will have mostly red DNA, but a little bit of blue. 
and this one will have mostly blue with a little bit of red. Okay, same thing on this chromosome. But if you notice, this is one type of chromosome, maybe chromosome number five, and this is chromosome number one. Okay, they don't cross over at the same locations ever. Sometimes the top and the bottom, sometimes the top, sometimes the bottom, sometimes not at all. It, crossing over varies. And sometimes they cross over just a little bit, sometimes a whole bunch. It varies every single time sperm and eggs are created. So you get genetic variation. After the crossing over has occurred, then you go into metaphase one. Just like metaphase of mitosis, they align on the metaphase plate. So your whole tetrad is lined up. Then the tetrad pulls apart. Two, one chromosome is going to come this way. One chromosome is going to come this way, each with sister chromatids. Okay. Go into telophase one. Um, the chromosomes reach the opposite sides of the cell. Sometimes, most times not, a nuclear membrane is going to form around each set, and you begin cytokinesis. This is kind of a really short phase. There is no interface between between telophase 1 and going into mitosis 2. Okay, no DNA replication, so we stay at 2N number. Okay, this is cytokinesis where it's dividing. Then you go into prophase 2 right away. If there was a nuclear envelope forming, it disappears, the spindle reforms, the two sister chromosomes are still connected at the centromere, sister chromatids actually, um, and they start to line up. There is no crossing over this time, nor is there any tetrad, because there's only two sister chromatids. You don't have four like you had before because the cell divided. Okay, so each of the two cells, this is what's going to happen. They're going to kind of pair up again. Go into metaphase 2, they line up on the metaphase plate. They pull in opposite directions. In anaphase 2, telophase 2, the nucleus is going to reform, the chromosomes unwind, and you end up with four different types of cells. Each one is different from the other. Um, four different types of sperm or eggs. If you do that with 23 different types of chromosomes and crossing over occurs in different locations every time you create sperm, you end up with millions and millions of different types of, of sperm possible. Every sperm is genetically different from the other. Every egg is genetically different from the other. That's why in a family, you don't have, unless they're identical twins, you and your sister or brother don't look identical. You may have a strong family resemblance, but you don't look identical to each other because the chromosomes have crossed over in different locations and you have different types of sperm and different types of eggs that, that made you. So that's meiosis. Okay, um, a couple things can happen. You can have... Um, a random assortment of the chromosomes as they start to line up so that when you have creating your sperm, let's just use sperm instead of eggs, okay, just because men produce so many more. Um, when you're creating your sperm, some of the sperm are going to have chromosomes that all came from your mother. Some are going to have chromosomes that all came from your father. Most of them are going to be different combinations different combinations, some from mom, some from dad, one might be from mom, and two from dad, and three from dad, and four, and on top of it, they're going to have crossing over occurring on some of them, but not all of them, and crossing over is going to occur in different locations. So that leads to this random assortment of the gamete, of the, the chromosomes, and of the genes. No two sperm, realistically, no two sperm are going to be identical to each other. So it leads to just astronomical number of different types of offspring that can come from. Okay. Um, basically it happens because some of the DNA, when you're creating sperm, you have your mom's chromosomes and your dad's chromosomes. Realistically, the, the babies, the, the kids, are actually mixtures of the four grandparents' chromosomes. 
It's just kind of weird to think about that. Okay. The whole purpose of meiosis is to get the chromosome number in half so that when you create an offspring, they have the right number of chromosomes. Also, meiosis, and very importantly, ensures di genetic diversity in organisms. That's really, really important. As we get into evolution and we talk about diversity, this is how it happens. Now, occasionally, mistakes happen. Okay? Sometimes the chromosomes don't separate properly during anaphase 1 or during anaphase 2. Sometimes two of them will be stuck together at the centromere and not be pulled apart. So one sperm, instead of having, 40, having 23 chromosomes, might have 22 or 24. Now, if that's the one that potentially fertilized an egg, the organism will have too many or too few chromosomes. That is, called, is a situation called non-disjunction. When we get into genetic diseases, we're going to look at several diseases that end up in non-disjunction. So here is in metaphase, and then they're supposed to be pulled this way and this way, so you get you know, two up here and two down here. But look, this one went the opposite direction, and so you end up with too many up here, not enough down here, and you end up with a n plus 1 number, so 24 chromosomes in a human, or 22 chromosomes in, in a human. So it leads to many different genetic diseases. Okay, we're going to um, give you a little bit of homework now. What I would like you to do is to, in a short essay, explain to me the benefit of sexual reproduction. Why do 99% of organisms go through sexual reproduction, at least some of the time? What is the benefit? Okay, that's your homework tonight. See you tomorrow. Bye.